We'll talk a little bit toward the end about uh, tsunami effects, but there the emphasis really is to kind of uh, just make people aware of what's going on and some of the things coming. There'll be a very brief discussion about bridges, but again, the, the emphasis won't be there. The primary emphasis is going to end up being um, uh, buildings. And so the main content, uh, we'll start out with unreinforced masonry buildings. Uh, we'll look at some examples where retrofits uh, were used, what worked, what didn't. Uh, we'll uh, look into then uh, reinforced concrete buildings. There's some important lessons there related to uh, uh, how buildings performed uh, primarily from Christchurch and from Chile and what that means uh, in terms of things coming up in U.S. practice. Uh, some lessons learned or uh, relearned in, uh, in relation to non-structural systems and stairs. Uh, for the first time we saw in all three earthquakes, many buildings that were seismically isolated and that were shaken uh, pretty well. And so there's some observations uh, related to those subjects. So that's the main emphasis uh, for the discussion here. And as we go along, we'll take a break somewhere uh, in the middle or a couple of breaks uh, to give you a chance to ask questions and uh, stretch uh, if you need to. So it's kind of a long presentation. Anyway. Starting out with the URM buildings, uh, there are really four types that we know uh, of uh, in terms of the, the kinds of buildings that we often run into, but uh, in the earthquakes uh, that uh, we're, we're really interested in, the structures we're interested in, the main interest is uh, unreinforced masonry bearing wall type buildings in the upper left. Uh, confined masonry, you know, popular system uh, in Chile, uh, but not something we see much of in the United States performs great, uh, but again, it's not something really relevant for our interest here. Uh, just some examples. We'll go quickly uh, through some of the, the typical examples that we saw uh, in uh, Chile and then also in Christchurch. Uh, URM uh, churches uh, in uh, Chile, uh, typical uh, failures uh, we see here. Uh, complete out-of-plane failure and fall of the, the brick uh, in this highly rated restaurant uh, in one of the guidebooks uh, in the city of Curico. Uh, not the place to be going uh, uh, for future dinners, for sure. Uh, the uh, observations uh, in, uh, in uh, Chile uh, were fairly typical. They were widespread, uh, not so unusual things to see. What was really unprecedented and, and, and quite uh, interesting and, and uh, informative was what happened in uh, Christchurch. And there, there was really an unprecedented number of uh, URM buildings that were damaged, uh, buildings that were not retrofitted, buildings with partial retrofits or full systematic retrofits. Uh, there's too much information really to cover in the time available. So we point you to uh, these two reports, which really go into detail on what happened uh, a lot of data, a lot of detail on individual buildings and statistics on buildings. Uh, if you're into this subject, you want to know about this subject, you can go online and you can pull these down and, and that's where the real information is. Uh, we'll just give a synopsis of some of the main observations here. Before we get going, uh, as has been uh, already mentioned, uh, Christchurch has had a series of earthquakes uh, that have uh, occurred repeatedly uh, over a period. And uh, there's, there's two events that really are, are of main interest uh, from our perspective as engineers. Uh, the first one in September of uh, 2010, uh, we are showing here, let's see if I get the mouse over, uh, some design spectra to give you a sense of what the uh, shaking intensity was in the first uh, September event. And what's shown here, uh, the upper curve is referred to as high seismic design basis earthquake. That would be typical of what we would have, say, in Berkeley, California. And in fact, this spectrum uh, relates to that. That's the design spectrum in Berkeley. Uh, moderate seismic, uh, this lower curve here is Portland. Okay, so to give you a sense of where the design basis earthquake would be for the U.S. Uh, in Christchurch, uh, the design basis earthquake was this solid black curve here. And uh, the event that occurred in uh, September uh, if you look at the average of the 5% damped response spectra, uh, tend to fall pretty close to that. So it's fair to say that there was a design basis uh, level of shaking uh, in uh, Christchurch and the vicinities uh, of, uh, during that event. The next event that occurred was quite different, quite stronger. Uh, and uh, that's shown here in the same scale, 
Uh, what we're looking at now for the high seismic is uh, this long uh, broken curve. Again, it's Berkeley, but it's uh, considered really near field uh, MCE level of shaking. So uh, that would be what I have to face uh, in uh, my life in Berkeley. Uh, Portland at a moderate seismic zone, but again, looking at MCE would fall there. Uh, Christchurch 2500 year return period would be uh, this curve shown here. And looking at the, the response spectra that were uh, calculated and average for this event, uh, they by and large in the period range of interest saw the MCE level of shaking uh, in, in these events. Maybe not the same, really in terms of duration, but the intensity of shaking that occurred was really very strong. Uh, another thing that was quite different about the two different earthquakes was the fact that one was predominantly north-south. The strongest shaking was north-south direction. Uh, the later event was predominantly east-west. And so this caused some different uh, types of behavior and different results. So it was not only the intensity of shaking, but the predominant directions were different as well. Let's go back to the September event. So we're back looking at the lower response spectrum. Uh, PGA of about 0.2 G. Uh, is where uh, we would kind of uh, peg this shaking intensity. And it caused widespread damage, but mostly it was damage to components, not overall collapse of systems, but component damage. Looking at, the, again, just the unreinforced masonry as a starter, uh, we had a lot of damage uh, in uh, unreinforced masonry. Typical uh, damage was uh, in gables. Uh, you can see a little bit of damage there, uh, a little bit more severe damage more in the gables, uh, an example of a, a gable fall, uh, and this, would have, this one uh, fell onto an adjacent uh, building, the painted room, and probably would have killed uh, if there had been people uh, in that adjacent building. But it was 4.35 in the morning, nobody was there, uh, and so it didn't kill. Um, here's an example of gable retrofitting, uh, worked partially, uh, but essentially it fell apart under this 0.2 G level of shaking. Uh, now this is uh, a retrofit where you've got retrofit anchors with washers. Um, generally it was observed that if there were plates uh, applied up at the top of the gable, those held the system together better and generally worked better. Uh, in fact, worked pretty well in most cases where these plates were used. So this was a much more effective way of retrofitting the gables uh, than just the, uh, the washers themselves. Uh, similar case uh, here, uh, Bill Holmes especially likes uh, this one because we've got a, a masonry out of plane fall onto the building next door which happens to be the monumental masons and so no one was safe in this event but still no one was killed in fact. Uh, there are other examples, uh, small trim, things to just keep in mind, uh, uh, fell uh, it's small trim, but it's still dangerous if people are about. And so to keep in mind, those things have to be watched for. But again, this again occurred in September. It was overnight. Nobody was out and about. Uh, Christchurch was a late night town, I, I know, uh, especially on weekends. But uh, this time of morning was pretty quiet, so uh, no one killed. Uh, again, a little bit more severe, complete out of plane failure. So there were some pretty significant failures that occurred but no in-plane action really to speak of. It was all out of plane, okay? Overall URM damage, uh, we can look in the upper left really is where the, uh, I think the pie chart of interest is. And red tags were in about 22% of the URMs, uh, again, for about 0.2 G of uh, peak ground acceleration. And then you've got yellow uh, in about, I can't read the percentage, 30%, and the remainder is green. Uh, not really green up there, but green tag buildings. Uh, so overall summary from the September event. So uh, the gables are pretty vulnerable in PGA of about 0 0.2, 0 0.25 G. Some parapets failed. Uh, there were some complete out of plane falls uh, into the streets. Uh, very little or no in plane distress was observed in the buildings. Uh, and there were no, no fatalities from the event um, Although they counted about 150 locations of killer brick falls. So had people been out and about and in those locations, uh, there were 150 locations where uh, fatalities could have occurred on the basis of what fell. But again, 
It was 4.35 in the morning, so there were no deaths and no significant in injuries uh, to speak of. The event that occurred uh, some months later, February of 2011, quite different. Again, now we're talking about uh, essentially MCE level of shaking, uh, which shook uh, the central business district and surrounding area in Christchurch, uh, not a young city, uh, and had very significant effects in this case. Uh, looking at some examples, uh, here is an example from Littleton uh, nearby, uh, from the February event, uh, complete out of plane failure. This one's particularly interesting in the sense that the lights are still on. And we usually think uh, in terms of performance level, well, no damage, uh, service level, lights out, uh, then some non-structural and structural damage and so on. Well, th here's an example that turned it around. The lights were still on uh, after this uh, fairly complete failure uh, for a while, and then the lights did go out. Uh, more complete gable damage was observed, uh, widespread. So here you see more of the gables coming out. Uh, more complete damage, more of the same. Uh, complete wall failures, again, uh, the gable taking an entire wall out. Uh, stepping back, uh, looking down some of the city streets, you can see essentially entire blocks of URM buildings uh, taken out uh, in a row. And stepping even, even further back from that, you can see the extent of the damage and what fell out into the street in February. Um, in the case of the February earthquake, it was more severe shaking, and it happened uh, in the middle of the day, and so there were casualties, uh, many casualties from this event. Uh, in terms of cumulative damage, uh, there certainly is some observation, some evidence that uh, the accumulation of damage uh, had its effects. If we look after, you know, here's one example after the September 2010 event. Uh, there's a little bit of cracking. I don't know if you can see in this slide, but there's a chimney here. A little bit of cracking in some of the masonry. Uh, the building held together pretty well. This is the September event. In the February event, the damage became worse. Uh, lots of in-plane action. Now we've got shaking levels and stress levels up to where we're getting uh, sheer damage in the walls in-plane. Uh, notice that the chimney is no longer. It's gone. So that has failed. And then, uh, interestingly, in some minor aftershocks that occurred later on, uh, we see even further progression of damage. And so the accumulation of damage uh, is, is apparent in these structures. And of course, this is one thing that we have to question uh, about uh, you know, the damage in these structures, that as multiple earthquakes occur, damage does accumulate and spread. There uh, were, uh, again, statistical studies done of the overall damage uh, that occurred uh, uh, from September. Uh, we look, uh, let's see, this is damage that occurred, I think, uh, let's see, what is this? I've got this one. The colors always throw me off in this one. This, this is actually um, after September. This is, says from September, but after the September event, um, so the, the next event, next earthquakes that occurred, we've got about 60% of the buildings now falling into major or heavy or destroyed category. So about double the number from the September event are now in this, this very heavy red tag or completely collapsed state. Uh, the color scheme, uh, I apologize, isn't quite right, the same as we tag the buildings. Uh, so in terms of retrofitted URMs, uh, there were URMs that were retrofitted in Christchurch, uh, less than uh, 100. Uh, to be certain, and uh, probably closer to half that number were, that were really pretty well documented. Uh, why so few? Well, uh, you know, Christchurch was uh, zoned as a relatively low seismic zone, you know, 0.22 G PGA. Uh, the only trigger for mitigation was renovation. Uh, so uh, if there was a renovation, then a building might get uh, triggered for retrofit. Uh, others, a few others, were done voluntarily. The criteria varied pretty widely. Uh, sometimes it was parapets or parapets and wall ties. Uh, sometimes there was a systematic, systematic uh, retrofit that provided a complete load path and a new lateral system. And uh, quite commonly in the case of Christchurch, the uh, retrofit that was implemented was a, a frame. And the frame was designed to take 
really the entire uh, seismic force. So there wasn't a, uh, the type of design that we often count on where you, you rely on the masonry to pick up some of the action and, and back it up. There was a completely new system put in in some cases, but it varied from one place to the other. There was no real systematic way that things were done. Um, in terms of uh, really detailed summaries, again, if you want to see what exactly happened to individual buildings and the detailed statistics, the Ingham reports, the two that I noted at the beginning, are the place to get the real details. But you know, some take-homes, uh, you know, in FEMA 547, which talks about retrofitting uh, techniques for older hazardous buildings, um, the details that are recommended for uh, epoxy uh, drilled in dowels are the ones shown up on the right. So you've got a, a dowel that goes into the wall, uh, typically goes in uh, with a, uh, a, a, what do they call it, screen tube, and uh, the epoxy. Uh, if it's just for shear, the anchor goes straight in. Uh, if you've got to deal with uh, shear and tension, uh, then the anchor typically recommended to go in all the way and at an angle. Uh, there was really none of this uh, to be found that we know of uh, in Christchurch. Uh, it was kind of done uh, however it was deemed uh, appropriate to do. There wasn't much guidance uh, on how this was to be done. And many of these things failed. And so uh, you note some of the failures there. Uh, there were really no angled placements. Uh, the lengths of the embedments were often very short. The length of the epoxy was maybe a few inches. Uh, and many of these things failed. Uh, recommendation really is you know, to follow the, the practice that's in 547 if you want these anchors to, to hold. Um, you know, even though at the, you know, even what's in 547, you get to the top of one of these masonry walls with very low gravity load and, and that's a tough condition and even what's in 547 may not hold so well. And so it's, it's a tough design uh, area. The washers uh, work better where they were used uh, but even those, when they were up at the top of a wall, very commonly came apart, and the walls came apart, uh, even with those washers uh, in place. Uh, some sample statistics for retrofitted URMs. Uh, again, about 28% or so had severe damage, so uh, again, cutting in about half the amount of damage compared with what happened for URMs that were not retrofitted. Uh, it, it's hard to draw a, a, a broad conclusion from this because there really weren't any systematic ways uh, that the New Zealanders went about uh, doing their retrofitting. Okay, so it was kind of uh, ad hoc uh, when they did retrofitting and exactly how they did it. And you would find in one building different techniques being employed without apparent uh, reason. But the retrofitting where it was implemented and well implemented, especially where new supplemental frames were added, worked really well. Uh, in terms of casualties in Christchurch, uh, in September there were none. Uh, as pointed out before though, that was 4.35 in the morning. In February, right in the middle of the day, and there were several casualties. And uh, these were uh, largely associated with reinforced concrete buildings, existing older buildings. Uh, the CTV building, from 1986, 115 died. Pine Gould building, 1963 concrete, 18 people died. Other uh, building collapses, mostly URMs, uh, 42 people died in those, and another seven were killed uh, in other ways. And uh, this uh, brings to, to mind uh, something that's been often said in the US, which is that the collapse of one moderate-sized concrete building would be worse than the results of all the URM damage in an earthquake. And here's, here's an example where uh, the, the fatalities associated with the concrete buildings, even just the one of them, uh, 115 is uh, two, two and a half times all the casualties in all the other URM buildings that came down. And so they, they're less frequent perhaps, uh, but when one of these buildings come down, uh, the consequences can be really severe. Uh, in the U.S., it hasn't happened yet. So let's spend a little bit of time uh, talking about, uh, in some detail, what happened to some of these concrete buildings. And we'll, we'll pick on two of them that uh, did collapse. There's many other really, really interesting buildings uh, in Christchurch. Uh, 
uh, that we could talk about. But I wanted to spend the time, uh, Bill and I wanted to spend time talking about these two buildings that did collapse. Because I think it's instructive to see what were all the little problems and little aspects that one might have thought about and what was it that actually triggered what happened. And I think that affects how one thinks about a building when doing an evaluation. First one we'll pick is Pine Gould. Uh, this is the one that had the fewer casualties of the two. And if you look at the building, uh, 1963 construction, what, five, six stories? Uh, first thing I notice when I look at the building, and probably most of you in the audience notice it as well, look at those skinny columns. Those are really little columns holding up a fairly big building. Uh, making it even worse is if you follow those columns down and you get to the first level above grade, there's a setback. And it turns out that the setback uh, stepped in uh, and the first floor was supported on steel cantilevers and then you had a smaller footprint underneath that. And the, the obvious thing for an engineer looking at this building would be fix those columns. It turns out that the columns weren't the problem and the collapse didn't even happen at the first level. So what we would all, I think, be drawn to turned out in this building not to be the problem. Although it might have been because a structural engineer got there uh, before this earthquake happened and, and implemented some small uh, retrofits. Anyway, another look at the concrete system. Uh, here in a 3D perspective, uh, there's an interior core of six inch thick walls. Uh, there's no gravity pilasters uh, around uh, the corners. There's no boundary elements or ductile detailing to speak of. Uh, the reinforcement was one curtain of steel, uh, number four is at 16 inches horizontal and there were number six verticals as needed. Uh, in some ways it almost looked to engineers looking at the building that there may be, in some ways it looked like there wasn't even a rudimentary design implemented. In one example, uh, there were connections where the girders framed into these six inch wide or six inch thick walls and there was no apparent detailing that connected uh, the beams, the girders, and the walls. Uh, the, the beams came in and landed on the concrete walls, no extra reinforcement, no joint, no pilot, no column supporting it, just nothing. And so uh, there was kind of a, a curiosity in the building. Um, anyway, girders span from the core out to these little 10 inch by 10 inch perimeter columns. Um, if we look at a plan, uh, the first story of the building is shown on the left, uh, not the most crisp uh, graphic, but I think you can see there's a major wall going across here that turns, there's walls here turning across there. So many walls sort of filled about a third to a half of the first story in the building. A little bit eccentric, but well reinforced with lots of structural walls. As we got up to the second level, uh, referred to as level one uh, in New Zealand, uh, the walls cut back significantly. And the walls really ran, where's my cursor, uh, about only now three bays in one direction, north-south, and in the east-west direction, just one bay. And many of these walls were discontinuous on the walls below. And so the low path uh, was a little bit tenuous getting from the second floor down to the first. Now, uh, so we note the different number of walls. Uh, there's these short cross walls. Um, one other thing to note as we're looking at the plan, I think it's worth remembering that in the September event, the earlier event that wasn't as strong, the shaking was predominantly north-south. And north-south is up-down in these figures. I, I think actually uh, north is down uh, in this case. Uh, and the, the, the obvious joke is it's New Zealand and north goes the other way. And I remember, I remember taking my kids there uh, when, when they were little kids. I, I went to Christ Church uh, and spent six months. And uh, they, they were always surprised to, to see, of course, the different stars and different this and that. But the maps, sometimes just for fun, were all flipped upside down and north was down. And uh, the world was turned upside down there. But anyway. Uh, in this example, you know, if this shaking's up down on this plan, everything's pretty symmetric. There's lots of walls. The discontinuities aren't so obvious. Turn that around and now start shaking it 
strongly in the east-west direction. And now you've got a, quite a significant setback in the framing system. You've also got pretty significant torsion in the upper levels. Your center of resistance is someplace off here and your center of mass, you can guess pretty well what that is. So now you've got a different system responding to the earthquake. And so the direction of shaking makes quite a bit of difference. This building was inspected after the September event. It was green tech. Uh, in February, the building collapsed almost completely and suggests there must be a very brittle failure in these kinds of systems. And it, it raises a question about the inspection uh, you know, if you go into a building of this type, if it's so brittle uh, and you don't see any damage, it doesn't really tell you what you might expect if you get the event again or a little differently. And so that's always something to keep in mind. Should, should we, when we go into these buildings, do more than just inspect, but maybe also look and think about the framing systems more and, and look at the drawings. But you know, that, that's something that has to be worked out, I think, with owners when you get that deep in. Uh, so uh, overall performance performs really well in September. In February, a uh, very short duration really brings the building down and kills 18. Uh, this is the, the, a shot of the building after the uh, February event. Uh, you can see the, the spindly columns collapsed, uh, collapsed in various directions. Uh, it collapses over multiple stories, so once this thing got going, those thin columns didn't hold together so well. Uh, the first story is fine. Okay, so the, the story that had the setback, but all the shear walls uh, performed well. You can see the penthouse, the core, leaning precariously uh, in one direction up at the top. We can look at this from another view. And pretty well, that wall held together. Uh, it's broken somewhere down at the first level, but above that, it, it moved pretty much as a rigid body and, and hung together. The actual failure occurs uh, somewhere above the first level. Bear in mind, the first level is the first elevated level. It occurred in that story above there. Uh, the engineering company, uh, Becca, who did the detailed analysis on this building, believes it was a flexural failure. We don't often think about flexure causing the collapse in a shear wall, uh, but they think it was a flexural failure that, that did this. Others think it maybe could have been uh, partly related to uh, shear effects. Uh, looking a little bit closer to see why there's questions about what happened here, uh, we can look at the tower cross walls. And uh, again, the first level is pretty stout. There's walls that go on uh, pretty widely. But as you get above what's listed as level one, you've got these fairly narrow walls with significant openings in them. Uh, you have in many locations like here, uh, pretty narrow piers, uh, which would of course be a place that I would think of looking if I'm concerned about shear failures and shear distress. Uh, so this is the failure zone somewhere in the first level. The engineers who really spent time on the building think it was a simple flexural failure that, that caused this thing to come apart. Uh, but uh, Bill Holmes uh, thinks maybe it was influenced uh, uh, quite a bit by shear. Uh, the back wall, the furthest south, which is the furthest up on that plan that I showed, is solid, which of course adds to the torsional problems that you'd have in a building like this. Um, there was, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a risk reduction effort uh, that had been undertaken for this building uh, back in 1997. And uh, at that time, the building had changed ownership. Uh, according to the earthquake-prone rules uh, in New Zealand, an earthquake-prone building is one that's deemed to be prone to collapse given a certain level of shaking. And uh, the way the New Zealand building standards define the earthquake prone building is that it's a building that has a strength of 33% of the new building standard strength or less. And when they looked at this building, uh, it clocked in at about 40%. So uh, it was not deemed an earthquake prone building. Uh, but, uh, and in fact, no requirements were uh, anywhere to retrofit this, but uh, the engineer convinced the owner that it would be worthwhile to take at least a, an inexpensive retrofit to take care of the most vulnerable component. Uh, 
And what was identified, which I think all of us would have picked out of this building, is these very vulnerable little 10-inch columns. And so what was done was to back each one of those with a steel tube uh, that had a support plate, top and bottom, uh, pinned, uh, essentially to act as pre-shoring for the building. So in the event that the building shook enough that the columns came apart or their connections with the floor frames came apart, you'd have a backup system that would hold this together. Uh, that system was designed, though, for inches of lateral drift, not feet. And what happened apparently in this building is that it moved feet once the core wall fractured and started going sideways. And then this uh, retrofit of propping the floors up just didn't work. Uh, this kind of retrofit has been used uh, quite frequently in the United States. Uh, I see it uh, in little parking structures. I see it in mid-rise buildings where it's difficult to get uh, an adequate assessment of a building uh, capacity or where uh, it's too difficult to get jacketing around the columns. This building uh, comes from the Berkeley campus and uh, is a building where the architects uh, work and live. And it has fin columns uh, and the girders stand inside those fin columns and nobody knows how those things work. And there was an effort made to try and develop a testing program for, for the system. Campus didn't want to invest in that. And so what was done was to back this system up with these steel pipe columns, which uh, span from floor to floor, from the roof all the way down to the foundation uh, for every other column in the building. And the whole idea is that it's to hold the system up in the event that the columns begin to fail. Uh, but you've got to have another lateral system that's solid. And this building has new shear walls that were added that we hope work pretty well. Okay, so that's the first building. Uh, the second building that came down uh, is the CTV building. And this one to me is, is shocking in some ways because of the date of the building. Notice 1986, which sounds like a long time ago. Uh, but I was there for my six-month stay in 1990. And I remember at the time uh, thinking these New Zealand engineers are really very advanced. I was working with uh, some of the university uh, professors, uh, Professor Park and Pauli and other people, and the thinking about seismic design was, was quite advanced. Uh, and uh, you know, looking around, I assumed that the practice was as good as the best thinking about uh, earthquake engineering. And, and clearly, uh, what was going on in practice there uh, perhaps not unlike what goes on in the U.S., was not at the same level uh, as, as what was going on uh, in, in the advanced thinking and in the building code writing communities and so forth. This building, again, one, two, three, four, six stories tall, not a very big building. Uh, you'll notice that there's a stairway coming up this side of the building. Uh, that stairway comes up along a um, coupled shear wall and to get to the landing and go in through the wall and into the building uh, in, in the opening uh, that was left. Uh, looking at a plan or an overall view of the building, here's the coupled wall there. Uh, there was another core wall up on the north side, a rather substantial wall, uh, but that wall was largely on the outside of the building. It, it sort of touched the floor plan, but just touched it. Uh, and then there was also a, a masonry wall uh, infill in some of the lower stories, but that was really a, a fire protection uh, wall that was uh, put in that location. Uh, the investigating engineer that looked at this building initially thought maybe that the collapse had to do with that masonry infill, but that really didn't gain any traction, and the attention then turned to other parts of the building. So the lateral system uh, in the north-south direction is really all that north core. East-West, you've got the North Core plus the coupled wall system down at the bottom here. Uh, the gravity framing system is a pre-cast starter beams that were placed on cast-in-place columns. Uh, there's no ductile detailing in, in any parts of it. Um, in fact, the columns, I think, had, I think there were 16-inch diameter. Uh, they had spirals that were essentially a pencil wire uh, at about a 16 to 18 inch pitch. So there was almost no transverse steel uh, in those columns. 
uh, but you know, they were gravity columns. And you know, our practice back uh, prior to the Northridge earthquake for gravity columns uh, wasn't any better in a lot of cases. Um, the, uh, anyway, the, the starter beam system, we'll show some more of it. Uh, there was a, uh, a metal deck placed on that that spanned in the north-south direction, the long direction, and then a, a concrete with wire mesh put on top of that. So looking a little bit more at the plan, you can see where this north core is located, really on the outside of the floor plan. Uh, I think, let's see, there's a little bit of animation. So there's the north core tower, the coupled front shear wall. Uh, the gravity frames run east-west and sit on those columns. And then spanning north-south between them is the, the metal deck with the, the uh, uh, concrete fill with wire mesh. Um, the details for the gravity system are quite interesting, and I don't know how often we find this kind of detail, uh, but probably not often in the US, but uh, it's interesting to look and see how a little thing can change the behavior of a building at, that we might not ever think about. Uh, the uh, starter beam and plan uh, is precast. Uh, it's meant to fit, as shown on the left-hand figure, around the circular cross-section column, and then the concrete gets cast through there. So it's got a little circular cutout there. And uh, the bottom, if we look at an elevation of the beam, uh, the bottom bars hook up. Uh, those bottom bars will presumably overlap inside the column, if all fits up well. If we look at a cross-section of the starter beams, uh, we see them with the, the part that's cast in place here. Uh, the stirrups above, the top steel is continuous, and the metal deck is set on top of that and then cast on top of there with um, the mesh. And then last but not least is the uh, beam column connection in plan. And there's a formed surface, of course, for the precast starter beam. And that formed surface is really smooth on the bottom, and it's also really smooth uh, well, along the inside face. So if we look along the inside face here, uh, pieces of it that were inspected after the earthquake, uh, engineers came away saying that uh, it was as, as smooth as a baby's bottom. I mean, it was just smooth and uh, slick. I don't know if baby's bottoms aren't slick, but uh, that's what I heard. Uh, but anyway, uh, it was really a slick interface. There was no surface roughness there whatsoever. Uh, and some suspect that that little detail had a fair bit to do with the overall failure of the system. Uh, we look at uh, a little bit more about the gravity framing system and uh, then the lateral system. Uh, the obvious flaw that many people found after the earthquake, the first thing that almost everybody identified is that there's not much connection between the uh, north core and the floor diaphragm that it's supposed to be supporting. Uh, there's no collectors that are really apparent. You know, normally we think we put some collectors in, these dotted lines to drag some of the load into the floor system. Uh, although the building code had some sections on diaphragms, the uh, requirements for diaphragms were, were really pretty weak at the time, uh, not unlike some of our codes. And there were no apparent collectors. These dotted lines did not exist. And so in terms of the north-south direction, there wasn't much to collect the load in there. Uh, we take a cut along axis four, this axis across here, uh, and then look at the cross section down below. Um, all there was crossing that interface between the diaphragm and the shear walls here uh, was number fours at eight inches. Those number fours, though, were designed for gravity force resistance, not for lateral. And so their capacity was, was at least partially used up just by resisting gravity force and there wasn't maybe a lot left for a seismic. Uh, it gets even a little worse when you look at some other aspects. If we go east-west, uh, you've got to get the shear force from the floor system into this wall here. And uh, unfortunately there are a lot of voids um, separating that north wall from the floor system and uh, shaded kind of bluish gray. Uh, you can see where there were huge voids there, so there was no path to the 
uh, north wall there. All the seismic really had to go through this system here, and it just really wasn't detailed for that. So the diaphragm was really very poorly put together. Everybody called this out, so that's got to be what caused the building to come down. Um, there had been a study of this building. Uh, again, uh, I think background in the 1990s, somebody took a look at the building for whatever reason, maybe there was a change of occupancy, and decided, hey, the, the diaphragm doesn't look so good. And so, kind of like the Pine Gould building, uh, the engineer took care of what was the most glaring deficiency and made sure that there was some kind of a load path for the diaphragm to get into that wall. Uh, but the requirements were pretty minor in the building code at the time, and there were really no requirements of exactly what had to be done. So what was done was to install a, a small angle iron uh, that on one leg connected to the walls and on the other leg connected through bolting up into the, the floor diaphragm above. Pretty small retrofit, only done at the upper levels, and the lower two or three levels of the building didn't get this retrofit whatsoever. And no one really knows why, other than it was a minimal uh, in invasion of the, the property, and uh, the expense was low, and that was where the most vulnerable place was, was up high. Okay, so that's added there. A little bit of the detail of how it was done. Uh, apparently not enough. Uh, so in September, quite similar to the Pine Gould building, uh, the earthquake occurs, the building is inspected, uh, it's green tagged. There is no apparent damage. And in, in many studies after that event, uh, no one really can find any evidence that there was damage uh, that would have been anything but a green tag for this building. Uh, in February, another earthquake comes along and the building has pancake collapse and 115 uh, people die. Mostly students, many of them foreign students uh, studying uh, in the building. Uh, we've seen the images probably of this building. Uh, there's uh, one shot, the core shown in the background standing. Uh, an aerial view, you can see the core again standing uh, pretty plumb. Uh, other things you might notice, uh, here's the stairs lying on top of the uh, stack of pancakes. Uh, suggests a failure mechanism. Uh, whatever happened to the building, the collapse started on the inside, the inside came down, and the coupled wall then was pulled over on top of it. Okay, so it doesn't seem to have been that that system came down first on the far side. Something happened on the inside that started the collapse. Uh, there's no real evidence about exactly what happened. And this has been through hearings and multiple engineering investigations. Uh, some engineers have pointed out the extreme brittleness of the gravity system that may have caused collapse. Uh, others, uh, hang on a second. Okay, let's go back. I, I don't know why this is in this order. Apologize for that. Uh, others, you know, so, so some think it's really due to the amplified deformations that may have occurred because we've got a very stiff wall on one side, this flexible uh, coupled wall on the other. Uh, maybe there was some inelastic torsion as the coupling system yielded, although there's no evidence that it did. Um, some have thought, well, maybe uh, it's with these very poorly confined, heavily stressed 16 inch columns. Uh, maybe the beam column connections didn't have sufficient reinforcement. Uh, maybe the connection pulled loose, uh, although there's evidence that, in fact, the connections up at the top of the building didn't pull loose. Uh, but maybe it pulled loose down at the lower levels. Uh, maybe it's a little bit of each. Maybe it was the vertical accelerations that were measured uh, in the event. But there's really no clear evidence that there was a complete diaphragm failure that brought the building down. It may have been some simple aspects of the details of these starter beams. Um, and uh, Bill Holmes, my co-author on this presentation, uh, really points to those starter beams as being the likely culprit in this. And uh, you know, this was uh, examined as part of the post-earthquake investigations. And you know, this is looking at a, a typical connection in plan view. If you just think about gravity load mechanisms for the building, the resistance to gravity forces, there would be moment at each one of these starter beams. The moment would put the bottom of the starter beam 
in compression with tension at the top. Uh, because of this very smooth interface between the column and the starter beam, uh, you would essentially have to, you couldn't develop any friction on this surface. If you developed any normal force, it would have to be almost perpendicular to the circumference. And so this creates naturally an outward bending force uh, just from gravity on these little ears uh, that was likely to break the little ear off. And in fact, um, the uh, USAR engineers in the field who had investigated this building first noticed this, uh, that the ears were broken off. And that they were broken off not just in some beams, but every beam they found, uh, the ears had been broken off. Uh, and they found this very smooth, unbonded concrete that suggested that there was something wrong with this simple connection from the beginning. Uh, Bill likes to show this little graphic here. Well, what happens if you lose the ears on the precast system? All you've got left is this little bearing surface. And so quite possibly this thing was a wreck just waiting to happen because of the very simple gravity framing system that had been built into it. Uh, if that was the bearing system and that had to resist all the vertical bearing force plus the flexural compression, it was quite a brittle system uh, that could easily have just torn apart on its own. Uh, real question is who would have caught that? And uh, certainly in an a, a inspection after an earthquake, the likelihood that you're going to catch something like this is pretty small. The odds of catching this uh, in a detailed evaluation of the building, I think, are pretty small. I never would have thought of this, I think, uh, because that's not where you typically look. I, I might have thought, oh, the, this connection overall is not so good. But the, the inner detail of what actually may have happened here is, is kind of shocking, because how a little thing like that can really throw uh, the, a building into a very fragile state. Okay, so that one of the theories is that the wings fracture, uh, the joint partially comes apart, the beams have almost no seat left and come apart, and uh, anything that happens to this building that's of any significance after that could result in a, a pancake of the building as occurred. There's no consensus. Uh, many, many people have looked at these buildings and nobody really knows what happened other than it collapsed. Okay, and same with the Pine Gould building. Okay, uh, so it really, you know, there's lots of lessons uh, from uh, the Christchurch earthquake, and we'll go through this, and then we'll take a break, and we can have questions uh, and some discussion, but uh, partial retrofits, uh, like occurred in the Pine Gould building, or in the CTV building, the two concrete buildings, or that occurred in some of the masonry buildings, they're just that. Uh, they're, they're partial. Uh, they identify usually what the most critical deficiency is, and are we really thinking carefully enough what, what might happen if the shaking is a little stronger and gets to the next deficiency. It's obvious, you, you take care of the worst thing first, but how many of us really think, well, what's the next thing that's going to go? ASCE 41 uh, says if you're doing a non-linear static analysis, uh, you should push the building 50% further than you think the design event is going to push you. Why? Well, so you can see what might happen as you go to the next level, if you go further than what the design basis is. Uh, nowadays, so many engineering firms are doing nonlinear dynamic analysis and kind of have put the static analysis to the side that this isn't happening anymore. Engineers aren't thinking as much about what would happen if things go a little further. Uh, other question for us is, are we fixing uh, existing buildings fast enough? In the case of older concrete, there's not much retrofitting of these buildings going on. Uh, and they can be real killers, we know. Uh, or well enough in the case of the URM buildings. So those are open questions uh, and things we observed here. Uh, and then there's the other question, what, what happens when intense motions occur in our urban regions? Uh, are the building codes adequate? You know, the current focus is all on individual buildings. You design an individual building, there's a performance objective for that building. Uh, how does that performance objective for an individual building relate to what you expect might happen in a population of buildings? And we think, oh, there, there maybe is a 10% chance that a building will collapse uh, given ground motion that exceeds the MCE shaking level. That's kind of a, a level that we think our buildings might be at. 
uh, is that okay? You know, are we talking with uh, owners and policymakers about that? Not really. And then what does it mean in terms of a community? What, what happens if an entire city like Seattle or San Francisco is shaken by a, a big event and many buildings see this level of shaking? Uh, you know, we don't have MCE earthquakes, we have MCE shaking. But here was a case where an entire downtown urban area got the MCE level of shaking and it really manifests itself uh, in things that Laurie will talk about later on about uh, how badly hit the city was and, and can it recover. Okay, so those are some of the key questions uh, that come out of the Christchurch earthquake related to the URMs and the concrete buildings. I should take a break. Any questions? Comments? Yes, Heidi. Based on that, uh, that amount of things that came out of the Royal Commission about tagging and how we tag structures, do you just have any more thoughts on how that could affect the U.S. and what the actual plausibility of doing more detailed analysis in the tagging process, is that actually feasible? Yeah, so, so, so Heidi's asking in the Royal Commission reports a lot of discussion about tagging and doing more during the tagging process and, and is it actually feasible to do more? Uh, it's a great question. It, it's, it's one of the questions that's uh, in the structural engineering community right now um, because of Christchurch. How much more could you do? I, I don't know. I mean, oftentimes you know, right after an event, you're, uh, you know, you're trying to find out is there anything evident in a building that would suggest that the building's unsafe to go back into. Normally the thinking in my mind has always been, oh, the events that will follow will be smaller and the time between them will get longer. And so if it's okay, it's been through its, its test drive, it, it's probably okay uh, for what's going to follow. And what followed in this case was bigger. And so you know, that thinking has to enter into our thinking when, when an event happens is what are the probabilities that something bigger might be lurking around the corner. I don't know, Raphael, you look like you have opinions on this. I'll put, put the audience on the spot. Well, there's, uh, there are all sorts of uh, uh, related issues about how building owners feel about letting structural engineers into their buildings, and whether in fact we're being counterproductive by, uh, by taking that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. You know, if this was the presidential debate, you would say, well, number one, there, what would number two be? <laughs> Just kidding. I don't want to put you on the spot. Other questions, comments? Uh, yes. Uh, you had mentioned that the URMs in Christchurch that have been retrofitted with a frame performed pretty well. Yes. What kind of frame would that be? Wouldn't you want some deformation compa uh, cap uh, uh, compatibility between the U and the frame. And, uh, yes, uh, you know, and in the U.S., we typically would, you know, sort of count on some resistance in plane in the masonry. You put a stiff system with it. Uh, they essentially, um, you know, and, and again, as I mentioned, it's done differently. In, in all the every building seemed to be a little different. Uh, but um, the the typical approach there was to throw out uh, the capacity from the masonry and put an entirely new system in as a steel frame or a concrete frame, it, and it seemed to work, in fact, very well. Uh, and, and you would think, well, wh what's the compatibility between these two? How does it work? You can't use the frame until you lose the masonry, but it seemed to work very well. Other question? Yes? Are there any comparable buildings, same era, same type of construction that made it through? You're talking about the concrete buildings? Yeah. Uh, there have to be. I mean, you know, the precast construction it was very, still is very popular in New Zealand. And uh, I, I forget the details of how this came about, but there, um, you know, back it, when concrete was sort of in the fore and starting to come up as an industry there, uh, the way the labor unions and uh, uh, the industry sort of lined itself up favored precast construction. And there's a, a lot of precast concrete buildings there. And so uh, the expectation is probably lots of these buildings, uh, many of which apparently made it through the event. Um, as uh, you know, we'll see a little bit, there's some newer buildings that didn't fare so well uh, because they actually designed for high levels of ductility and they, they got what they designed for and uh, 
and now a lot of those buildings are being torn down. But there, there's got to be a lot more of these buildings in place that didn't come down. Or are they sitting there in a brittle state? There's, they're, they're standing there probably in a brittle state. Uh, many of them that were damaged, uh, there, there were lots of damage uh, in uh, several other towers, some that were leaning. Uh, I think Laurie will show quickly a picture of one of them later, but I'm not going to have time to talk about here. Very serious transfer problems coming down a building. And uh, that resulted in very high gravity forces on some columns and, and, and wall elements that were part of the seismic system. And when the shaking got going, those things were lost. And several examples uh, of uh, older buildings, and some not so old, where there were significant failures, uh, but the buildings overall stood. Um, and, uh, but there's probably other examples of these buildings that came through, and they're still standing there. Uh, I think the studies in that city are not by any means finished. It's one of the most well-documented uh, cases uh, I've ever heard of. Um, and I think you'll see later on when Lori shows what's happened to the central business district, a lot of the mid-rise buildings that were mainly concrete, they're gone. And in some cases, it's because of structural damage. Sometimes it was non-structural damage that uh, just made it too costly, uh, too easy to use insurance as a way out of the building, and the buildings are being demolished. Yes? Jim? Um, it seems like there's some issues on post-earthquake safety inspection at the SEA convention. A New Zealand engineer showed up. I think it was a fairly modern building, and it had very small cracks at the base. He said not enough to meet FEMA guidelines to require epoxy, mm -hmm. but the, the field engineer did a kind of quick calculation and estimated that the crack would have had to been much larger when the roof had displaced. And they chipped the concrete out, and they said every piece of vertical reinforcing was fractured. So there is a case where you probably give it a green tag and not give it a second look. So right. what do we need to do to ensure public safety? Yeah, well, you know, the, the, the question about inspection is a, an excellent one. I don't know whether it's better taken during the discussion section in the panel a little bit later. But uh, there were examples, as you say, where there's a little crack. The crack closes up uh, after the event. And a little bit of chipping, they find bars are fractured. And, and in many cases, those were problems with uh, very lightly reinforced walls. We'll, we'll have a little section on that coming up. But very lightly reinforced walls that simply had, they got one crack and that crack became the weak section in the wall and snapped. And almost no damage to be found anywhere else. Uh, there, there's other cases where uh, not life-threatening damage occurred, but the steel gets exercised by uh, the earthquake. And then uh, it, you know, engineers coming in looking at the buildings later on on behalf of the owner, I think you usually say, well, that steel's been worked, uh, that we've lost some of the ductile capacity of the steel. It's probably been, uh, it's going to age harden now because of the previous yielding, and that's going to change the mechanism in the building, and, and buildings are being taken down because the reinforcement has been exercised in the nonlinear non range, and it's lost some of its ability for the next earthquake. Down it comes. Uh, but your question about the inspection is, is a really interesting one because you know, how can you, in a quick inspection, see all the little problems? Or worse yet, when you go into a building and you don't see anything, like Pine Gould and CTV, and then uh, you get an aftershock and the whole building comes down. It, it's a real question that engineers are talking about now. You know, should you do more when an inspection is done than what we're currently doing? Maybe we should hold that question for later and see how much time we have at the end of the day, because we could spend lots of time on that. You said that uh, in New Zealand practice has changed with respect to anticipating being broke. Can you be a little more specific? Um, so uh, the question was, how has practice for uh, moment frames changed uh, in consideration of the frame growth problem and other problems? In effect, uh, the recommendation from CSOC is to design them for an R, I think it's of two, instead of what we use as eight. So essentially, elastic design is being considered. I, I, I don't know that that will actually end up in 
the code than in the practice, but they're really pulling way back on their special moment frames. Other questions? Yes? You had uh, mentioned the supplemental columns, uh, and I got the sense that you didn't think that was a great idea, but it seems like in uh, unreinforced masonry retrofits, where you're relying on unreinforced masonry for uh, gravity support, the supplemental columns is a recommended uh, support yes. system. Yeah. Uh, if, if I gave the impression I, I don't recommend them, uh, I, 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 let, me, let me take that back. I, I think in many cases you're going to come across existing conditions, you know, masonry, or you've got concrete system that where you calculate the, the deformation capacity is too low and you're going to lose axial capacity, or you've got a system you just don't understand. I think that uh, that supplemental column idea is a, a great one, but you've got to have enough of a lateral system there to keep the drifts low. And, and where it came apart in the Pine Gould building was that the, the wall failed, and once that happened, everything else was lost. Who would have thought a wall is going to fail in Fletcher? I mean, it's, it doesn't happen. Uh, and I, I think I, most engineers would look at that building and say, well, it's not a very big building. It's a little eccentric, but there's plenty of wall in it. The record is that wall buildings don't come down. You know, fix the columns and, and move on to the next problem. Uh, but uh, there's the case where a wall apparently brought a building down. So you engineers who, who think when you've got a wall, uh, leave that, let's look for the next thing. Maybe you should be thinking, what's the detail there? What I want to do next is, is to use a building example from uh, Chile where there was a one concrete building out of several that, that collapsed. And, and this is actually having some pretty serious impact on how we're thinking about designing concrete wall buildings uh, in the United States and some cha uh, code change proposals that are coming out of this. So this is the Alto Rio building from Concepcion. Uh, Concepcion is a, probably about uh, 250 kilometers south of Santiago, right close to where the epicenter was. Uh, so this magnitude 8.8 .8 earthquake occurs and uh, causes very serious damage to several buildings uh, around Chile, but especially uh, in Concepcion there were a concentration of these buildings and one, this one, that went over. Uh, this is 15 stories tall, pretty new building, 2006 design. It was recently finished. Uh, people had moved into it, 75% uh, occupied, I think. Um, there is, you can notice other buildings being constructed around it. It had a companion building, uh, which was almost identical, that was just starting to go up. You can't quite see the crane, but here's a piece of the crane here. Uh, there was another uh, building going up, starting to go up right next to it, uh, that plays a little part in the failure of this building later on. Uh, in any case, uh, these buildings in Chile are quite different from what we build in the United States, uh, but uh, they do follow the U.S. building code. Uh, however, uh, because they typically will put about 3% shear wall area in the floor plan in each direction, compared with our typical uh, half to 1% in each direction, 3%, uh, such that you know, these are really solid, rock solid buildings. And you know, this culture of putting buildings together comes out of construction uh, history for them. In the 1920s or so, there was, uh, when concrete was just catching hold in uh, Chile, uh, there were some frame buildings and there were some wall buildings that had been built and an earthquake came along as they often do in Chile and the frame building came down and the wall building survived quite well and ever since then the culture in Chile for these moderate buildings has been to build them with reinforced concrete walls. And uh, when you go into a building, that's what you find for every wall. And if somebody goes into a building and they, they hear that, they say it's cheap and they don't want to move into it. They want a building that's got concrete walls surrounding them and protecting them, okay? So they build these really solid buildings, very strong because they get earthquakes all the time. Uh, they don't want them heavily damaged. They make them strong and stiff. And they adopt the US building uh, codes pretty much they have some differences here and there, but most notably, they don't put boundary elements in their walls. They don't put these special boundary elements from our code because they typically have found they don't need them in the style of building that they're building. Typical floor plan, look at all the walls. And uh, this is 
a typical plan for this building, but it's also pretty typical of a lot of buildings in Chile. There's almost nothing about this building that's unique. No particular reason that it went over. It, I think, was just unlucky among many. There's a corridor down the middle, residential construction, so that's the shared space. And then uh, off the sides, you've got the transverse walls. And uh, this separates the different spaces that people live in. Um, interestingly, what this does is it creates a system where there's a T or an L-shaped wall operating in the transverse direction in every case. So these are flanged walls that are very strong along the inside where the flange is and relatively weaker out at the edge where there's not much flange. Not unusual, these have a little return. Uh, the return typically continues past windows and so forth to be more wall that's on the exterior facade of the building. So there's quite a bit of wall out there, but it's not like what's on the inside corridor. Uh, this building, put the plan up there and look at a little bit more detail of what is going on in the framing system. So a, a slice through section at line eight, and what we see is a pretty typical elevation and typical of many buildings there. Uh, Notice that at the first level in this building, uh, the exterior wall comes down and sets back just a little bit. Now this little bit of setback, of course, you might say, wait, there's a problem. Uh, it's worse than it looks in the elevation because you lose all of that wall that's along the exterior as well. It's a big notch that occurs in the building. Sometimes it's at the first level. Sometimes it's the level below. Why do they do that? The architect tells them you've got to do it. Uh, why? Well, because it's typically a more constrained space than these buildings typically were decades ago. And parking is difficult. And so to get the cars in, they usually need to cut a little bit of wall off one place or another. Uh, this building has it. Probably a thousand buildings in Chile have this. It's very common. Uh, this building also has another little problem in it. If you look at uh, wall line eight, you've got these little pier walls that come down and things don't line up very well. And exactly how they get built is a little bit of a question as well. Uh, and so some people think, well, maybe the problem was at this connection here that might have gotten some things started. Others think it's just this typical detail uh, that was problematic. Uh, the ground motions in Concepcion, quite different from the ones that uh, we saw in Christchurch. Uh, maybe more like what we had in uh, the uh, Japan earthquake, except you know, in terms of duration, but the shaking intensity uh, a little bit heavier here in most places. Uh, the uh, east-west direction, 5% damp acceleration response spectrum has this big hump in it. I'm told that this is really associated with a, a, a soil type D uh, amplification that's occurring out at a period of about one and a half to two seconds. In the uh, north-south direction, which is parallel to the fault, uh, not quite the same effect apparent there. Um, the design spectra, if you're at soil type 2, which is what this building was designed for, you're there. Uh, if soil type 3, which is a softer soil, uh, about twice the amplitude at the first period of the building. Interesting to note, the building about 100 feet away from this was designed for soil type 3. And this building was designed for soil type 2. And that may have had a fair bit to do with the different performances. If you think about the fact that these are fairly brittle buildings, they're stiff, there are a lot of concrete walls, but not much ductile detailing in them. They're in some ways like some of the Christchurch buildings that came down. They're pretty brittle. Once something gets going, they can fail pretty quickly. So maybe strength was a big part of the picture. A typical damage case. Um, and it's interesting to me to look at the cross sections of the walls. Uh, many engineers uh, in Chile and in the United States look at a building like this and they say, well, this building has a solid wall at the first level with no openings. The wall width is the full width of the building, as strong as can be. Uh, you get up to the second level and you've got a, a stack of openings and so you've got two weaker walls acting there. And so the, the typical approach in these things is, well, you, you put the steel you need in the big wall at the first level uh, and the cross section you need there, and then you go up above and you 
do your ETABS model and you put the steel and the concrete you need up there without ever thinking the fact that the building is going to find the weakest path in which to fail. And the weakest path typically in one of these things is going to be, well, the, the moment is generated here in this freestanding wall, uh, but it creates flexural compression stress that fails the wall in the story down below. And so our thinking about how plain sections stay plain and we can take section cuts through buildings really is not how the building's working. Uh, so that very commonly the failure occurs at a section that we might calculate as being very strong if you take the full wall into consideration. But locally, right below this interface here, this wall width is all you've got to resist the moment from up above. So, you know, quite a serious uh, reduction in strength. Another interesting thing happens here, very common failure that we've seen. And what seems to be going on is we've got a stack of openings from up above. Uh, the cord steel comes down the inside of the openings above and anchors down into the solid wall below. And so as the walls flex back and forth, the boundaries are alternating in tension and compression and driving a tremendous shear into that panel that connects the two. And these things typically are not designed for that shear. You know, again, you, you do your ETABS cut and that thing doesn't exist almost. And so this is a zone that was damaged many, many times in buildings in Chile. And uh, a common approach is you run the steel down LD and cut it off. Uh, some engineers say, no, take that steel all the way to the bottom because they see this problem coming. Uh, even if you take it all the way down, rebar digs in in the first uh, development length of the steel. Even if it's longer, it'll dig in in that section and transfer the shear. You've got to reinforce that zone if you've got a high shear stress coming in. And we've seen this problem in the United States also. It's happened, I know, at least in one building in the 1989 Loma Crater earthquake. Brand new building, same problem. It stood though. A uh, little pilaster over here, or the, the little column, uh, did crush as the building went over. No one knows really what initiated the failure. There have been several studies of this building trying to understand why did it go over. And uh, some simple nonlinear analyses of some slices of the building, again looking at this wall section 8, uh, have looked at the initial uh, load displacement response of these buildings. And what happens is they crack about here. And they actually, no, this is cracking down here. They yield at this point. And right around here, the, the section crushes. And a very brittle uh, failure ensues after that with a quick loss of strength. We don't know how fast the strength reduction is. Uh, but once this thing starts to lose concrete in the compression zone on one side, it becomes a one-sided game after that. And these things start ratcheting over sideways very quickly. Uh, analyses of this building uh, suggest that once this thing starts heading in that direction, it'll just keep going and come over. Uh, this analysis becomes stable at about a 3% roof drift because of an artifact in the way the modeling is done. If it's done properly uh, with a real continuum model, this thing would go all the way over. And in fact, uh, what ends up happening in the building uh, is this. And this was uh, this building after the earthquake. Uh, the building collapsed in the direction of that uh, offset in the wall went over sideways, uh, rotated about the corridor walls, like a fulcrum, went sideways, uh, landed on the adjacent construction, the tower that was just starting to go up next door, and cracked down the middle. Uh, amazingly, although the building went all the way over, uh, only eight people died. So quite different uh, kind of collapse because the compartments are pretty well intact. Uh, now, you get quite a ride going over and you're, <laughs> Your chances of survival aren't great, but uh, you can survive a collapse like this because of the configuration of the building. Okay? Now, this building got a lot of people thinking about shear walls. By the way, before I talk about what we think the implications are for the US, I just wanted to note, you know, there are about 10,000 buildings, three stories and taller, that were built in Chile from 1985 uh, until 2009, right before the earthquake. And a very, very small percentage of these things collapsed. So they performed really quite admirably well 
considering. It's, it's not like the central business district in Christchurch where a lot of buildings did poorly. These did very well, uh, but the ones that uh, didn't, a few did actually go all the way. All right, now, there's some lessons for concrete wall construction that have come out of this and that are heading, it seems, into the building codes going forward. Uh, the main problem that was observed in these buildings in Chile was related to a crushing of a wall that's not very well reinforced and it's too thin. Uh, typical wall there and typical of the building that went over, the thickness is something like six to eight inches. Why are they so thin? Well, even though they have earthquakes frequently there, uh, enough time passes from one event to the other that somebody tries a little thinner and it works for five or ten years and then a little thinner and it works for five or ten years and then some event happens and you find out you're designing outside the, the range where your experience is good and some bad things can happen. This is a typical detail though. It's very thin walls, not much transverse reinforcement. You've got these flange sections. They're very strong with the flanges and that then puts a lot of demand, both in tension and compression on the stem. Uh, there's getting to be higher axial stresses in their buildings as they get taller and that's contributing also to these compression failures and crushing across very small heights of the wall is what's being observed over and over in these buildings. About 80 of these things have been found, not walls, buildings with these kinds of walls in them. And the hinge length is only about twice the wall thickness. Quite different from what we do in our building code uh, we think about the hinge thickness being half the length of the wall. It's only about twice the thickness if you get this kind of a failure starting. Now, what is it that we do in the U.S. that's different and is it enough? That's been one of the questions we've been asking. Well, there's the Chilean wall on the left. If special confinement is not required in one of our shear walls in a seismic zone, what is required then is what's on the right. This is a special shear wall but without the heavy duty boundary zone uh, that you would require if the demands are really high. You've got a hoop that goes around uh, and confines a portion of the section. Uh, there are some cross ties, uh, but these are spaced at about eight inches typically in one of these non-special boundary elements. It's not enough to make the uh, core strong enough to resist the loss of strength when the cover comes off. So if you spall one of these walls and the cover comes off, the strength of the core is, is not enough to force spalling to spread. So you get this very narrow, twice the wall thickness failure like they got in Chile, we think. Uh, what will it mean in terms of the building codes? Well, the current proposal that's going through the ACI building code, it's going through and it's not there yet and, and who knows how it might get stopped or changed. The thinking is that the current code is based on the uh, idea of a simple hinge forming at the base that enables the building to displace inelastically. Uh, if the hinge length is about LW over 2, then you need, about, uh, you need to satisfy this equation. And the important number in here is the 1 over 600. Uh, if the length is constrained to about twice the thickness of the wall, and that's, you're really checking that wall to see if that needs confinement, then the coefficient needs to change to something like 1 over 1,200. Okay, and what's going through the building code right now is to change that coefficient from 600 to 1,200. It's a huge change. And if it goes through, what it's going to mean is that if you've got a substantial wall building, you're going to have to provide confinement, heavy confinement, period. Uh, only a really short building with lots of walls is going to get away from having this special confinement uh, as shown in the next slide. Now, what's the special confinement that we currently have? Well, lots of details. This, this comes out of one of the NIST tech briefs. And uh, the important equation maybe to look at right here is this expression that says the amount of transverse steel that you need uh, is 9% of the area of the boundary, well 9% of uh, the spacing times the width of the core times F prime C over F Y T. Uh, that expression is what we currently require for a special boundary element. 
Uh, we've gone ahead and done some tests to see how does a boundary element of this type behave. I don't know where my cursor is. I bet it won't work here. How do I get my cursor by? There it is. So this is a compression test on a 12 inch thick wall that, is it going? It's not going. There we go. That it, under almost pure compression, there's a little bit of flexure in this, but very little. It's accidental. And the color scheme is we go from pink, which is no strain. By the time things turn blue, we're at a strain of about 0 0.003, which is usually where you expect an element like this to begin to give up. The strain's very uniform now because it's so low. We're compressing, compressing. And we'd like to see in a special boundary element that it'll start to crush and it'll spread. So we can spread that plasticity out and get a lot of deformation. So some blue is starting to happen and it's starting to concentrate. You notice it's over a pretty short length. Don't take your eyes off it. Boom. And what happens to this special boundary element is that it localizes over a length about equal to twice the wall thickness. And so the worry right now in the building code committee is that what we're doing for special boundary elements isn't enough and we need more transverse steel. Uh, what's going through the committee right now, uh, to add the other equation in that we currently use for columns, uh, reduce the spacing, we currently allow 14 inches, no unsupported bars along the edge because if those things start to buckle, you can get a notch and start losing the section. A lot of tightening up is being talked about for these boundary elements. Okay, and we'll, we're not sure exactly how this will come out, so don't uh, think this is a code requirement yet, but something like this is bound to happen, we think, for the 2014 building code, which is being worked on right now. Okay? Some other things that have come out related to this. We, see, we saw a lot of walls that buckled. And here's two examples from Chile. Uh, maybe this is a South American or a su Southern Hemisphere problem because they're over in Christchurch is another problem. We've never seen this in the US, uh, except in the laboratory. And so we're beginning to wonder, maybe we uh, have to worry about walls that are too thin buckling. And part of the problem is you know, if you have this moment vector on a flange section, uh, you get a lot of tension initially, where is this thing here, on the stem, and then you reverse the moment and you get a lot of compression on that stem. And this softened section is likely to buckle laterally. And even if it doesn't yield first in tension, if you start losing the cover concrete on a very thin wall, the likelihood that that's going to be concentric and stay stable is slim. What's coming out in the US in terms of thinking about this? Well, current ACI building code doesn't have any limits. Uh, we're looking now at a proposal that's before the building code committee is to limit the thickness to 12 inches in these walls. I suspect that one's gonna not make it through the full committee. But the old code, the old uniform building code used to have a height of story divided by 16. And that likely is gonna be coming back as a limit on wall thickness. It's not a very serious, severe limit, but it's better than nothing. So that's where we think the slenderness is going. Um, there was a mention about fracture of reinforcing steel. Well, the, I think we may be referring to the building in the middle. Had some cracking and a little bit of exploration of what was going on in there and uncovered, in fact, that some of the bars had, uh, at the cracks, had not only yielded, but they had necked and fractured. And one of the questions is, you know, have we seen this before? Well, sure, we saw this in Chile in 1985 and in some laboratory tests again. Uh, the New Zealanders are looking at this and saying, well, this is a big problem and are making big recommendations. In the US, there's no recommendation coming forth yet. But the basic idea is if you have sufficient steel in your boundaries such that when a crack forms, the strength of the crack section is bigger than the cracking moment. You'll force many cracks to form and then the yielding can spread over the height. If you have a wall in which you have very light reinforcement in the boundaries, then one crack forms and the steel strength at that section might be less than the concrete strength. And if that's the case, 
there's not enough steel to force the cracking to spread, and you'll get it concentrated yielding at one crack in a very brittle behavior. Now, one of the ways that this happens is very lightly reinforced walls. The other way is if you take a moderately reinforced wall and you spread that steel out through the length of the wall. It's a perfectly acceptable thing from the perspective of strength. It doesn't have much impact. But maybe that results in a section with very, very light steel at the boundary. And in New Zealand, they're stopping that. They're saying, no, we don't want to do this distributed steel anymore. Interestingly, in, down in California, in the Blue Book, uh, it's actually recommended, and there's a clause in the Blue Book that says, you shall distribute your steel uniformly rather than using boundary zones. Um, I'm uh, going back to SEAC and recommending they take that out. Um, I think it's not a good practice if you've got a moderate amount of steel. Uh, the New Zealanders are going in that direction. Uh, distributed steel is fine if you've got a lot of it, like the wall on the left. Uh, those are real people standing around there. Uh, if the amount of steel that you've got at the boundaries gives you a tension strength in the steel more than the cracking strength, you're set, because cracking will spread. Uh, but if you don't, you're better off putting the steel in the boundaries, I think, except for really squat walls where you're not really trying for a flexural mechanism. Okay? Moment frames. Uh, just a quick comment about them, not too much to be said. Uh, they designed their frames in New Zealand similar to how we designed them. Uh, there are some differences, but we don't need to get into those. Here's an example of a perimeter moment frame. Uh, it's largely precast. Uh, there's a precast system on the inside. Um, there's a historic facade down at the bottom of this building. I think it's because the Beatles stayed there in 1964. But uh, some other people think it's because the Queen stayed there uh, the same year. I'm, I'm not sure. But there's precast stair problems in this building as well that I'll just mention briefly going forward. What's the problem here? Well, in some of these frames, well, in any of these frames, if you concentrate the yielding in the columns, it's natural that the neutral axis in a beam is down near the compression zone, and the mid-depth is going to elongate. And uh, we like to think that when we reverse the load, that reverses, but it doesn't. And what tends to happen is that if you get more and more drift in a frame, let's say we go to 2% that our building code allows, the amount of elongation you get is about 2% of the depth of the beam. And what this means in a frame going back and forth is the beams start spreading out. And there's a couple of concerns that they're worried about. Uh, one in particular in New Zealand where there's a lot of precast flooring systems. Uh, they're finding that this elongation is beginning to pull the floors apart. And especially in corner columns where you're pushing apart in two directions, they're finding examples where the floor systems are coming unseated. They're just hanging on. Uh, and it's a cause for having to demolish, we think, several buildings. Um, the one, the Clarendon that I showed is one of the examples. Other people are worrying about other effects, such as if you have a system that's fixed to a subterranean podium slab or other foundation and it's growing upstairs, what does that do to the column shares and other things? So that's another thing we're worrying about. I want to finish off on three quick items. And we'll go fast because uh, there, you either go in really big depth or you don't at all. Non-structural, a lot of things that we've seen before, and I just want to point them out so we remember them. Uh, in Chile, you know, hospital ceilings down, everything down. Um, in uh, Christchurch, same thing if things weren't braced. The familiar story, Christchurch uh, library, uh, eight sections of shaking, look what it can do. Okay, so if you don't brace things, if you don't tie things down non-structurally, it's a problem. Um, and you can read about the lessons. I don't think we need to go through those. Stairs were a particular problem in New Zealand because of a practice of using precast stairs in their multi-story building. We don't do that so much here. Uh, but uh, the poster uh, for this one is the one shown here of people being moved out of buildings after the earthquake uh, by rope because you couldn't get them out any other way. Um, but here's an example of built-in stairs. If you've got a built-in stair, it's going to have to accommodate the drift. If you have a slider, it's got to have enough bearing. Uh, it's got to have, a, if it's um, 
slider, you also have to make sure there's enough mo movement capacity so you don't yield a, or compress a stair and yield it and shorten it. Some stairs are believed to have compressed, gotten shorter, and then in the reversal dropped off their supports. We've got examples like this of stairs dropping and stairs piling up at the bottom of stairwells and people can't get out. And as a consequence in New Zealand, uh, they're now designing for 1.5 times the MCE drifts. In the US, ASCE 7 is now uh, putting an importance factor of 1.5 on these things. Steel stairs also are susceptible. Sliders are heck to, uh, to detail. Uh, and if they're yielding, there's also some possible problems. And the, new, the uh, tests in UC San Diego have shown some problems that uh, we may have with our steel stairs as well. Um, isolation, uh, just to point out that there are many examples of isolated buildings there. Uh, I'm not going to show this video, but there are videos that are as cool as can be of what happened to these things. But movements that are up to like uh, 10, 15, 16 inches, and overall the performance is really highly successful. If there's questions afterwards, we can maybe show the video again. Uh, but the main conclusions you can read about, in Japan there's lots of uh, damper systems that are used, uh, steel yielding systems. You can see paint having uh, flaked off because of yielding. They use lead dampers. Uh, cracks were visible in several of these because they, they worked and chewed up energy. Lots of problems in all three countries in terms of isolation joints. Buildings on bearings moving more than the joints would permit, including examples where there are uh, uh, joint covers uh, down at moat levels and other places, almost as if in many cases these things are not being designed as if they're expected to move. And we saw it in Christchurch in New Zealand and elsewhere. So we have to expect those things to move. Uh, one advantage of having many shakes, uh, Christchurch had one advantage that we saw. Uh, after the February event, there were some permanent offsets in some of the isolators. And after many little aftershocks, uh, they straightened back up. So uh, there's a one tiny, tiny bright light there. but. Uh, not much. Bridges. Uh, we saw many lessons that we've seen before and not a lot of new lessons. So I don't think there's much time that should be spent on this. Uh, skewed bridges came off. Bridges that were with precast girders without end diaphragm. You got a bunch of girders sitting down on the abutment with shear keys. You get lateral movement and they shear off the girders. Um, and so the obvious things have to be adhered to. If you can't remediate a site, for liquefaction, you've got to deal with the movements that are going to occur. So you have to tie structures together, have adequate seats. And that was observed in several of these earthquakes. Christchurch, same thing. Big zones of liquefaction, that's where all the damage occurred. The older bridges that were built integrally with their supports all did well. Uh, the 1960s precast bridges and later that weren't tied together well enough showed some problems. So again, uh, the things we've seen many, many times. Other than that, in, in New Zealand, the bridges did very well. Uh, in Japan, long history with many earthquakes and a big code, and things worked. Uh, retrofitted bridges, they use all sorts of different systems, steel jackets, concrete jackets, restrainers, dampers. By and large, everything worked. Uh, Again, if the retrofits were only partial, as in a case where they had cut off longitudinal bars and hadn't fixed those but had tied the decks together, they had problems as they've had in past earthquakes and had to go back and clean up a little bit. But nothing really new. Uh, new bridges apparently went through the earthquake with no serious damage. Uh, so just some examples of some of the bridges there. Uh, my, uh, the word I get from the uh, experts in Japan, nothing serious. Uh, the construction that's going on for new construction, very similar to what we do uh, in California at least, and I think up here similar, uh, is working well. The, the provisions for modern construction work pretty well. The effects of near fault motion though were not tested. Uh, last little subject, tsunami. We could spend a day on this. Uh, I have two minutes, I think. Uh, 
I just want to point out what's going on in the tsunami area. Uh, this, uh, you know, the generation of tsunami in subduction events, so we've got to worry about them primarily there, especially there, the generation, uh, the water inundation levels, uh, you've got to consider what those are in design. In Japan, the inundation and the runoff <laughs> levels were tremendous. Um, there is a five or six story tall building. It's, it's tremendous levels of water. and That's got to be thought about. Laurie will mention it later in terms of uh, where your evacuation places, your emergency response places are. You've got to have sufficient height to resist these things. Yep. Wood buildings, if you've got two meters of water, it's a write-off. Uh, concrete buildings and some robust steel buildings can do quite well. Uh, bridge construction did well in some cases, but if you've got problems of buoyancy, uh, which can be a problem especially in precast decks with tsunami forces, things can start lifting and moving. And uh, longer span bridges may be a little more vulnerable to this effect, and tipping over in many cases. The fixes recommended in Japan, put holes in the deck if you've got precast to let the air out. Uh, if you've got a box girder, I don't know what you do. Uh, but tying things down for uplift forces is one of the paths forward in Japan. Tying buildings down is also important. Here's a steel building that became buoyant and with lateral forces lifted up, pulling piles out of the ground. And concrete buildings also get a buoyancy effect as shown in the floor slab here. Uh, lots of data about the kinds of debris that hit buildings, the accumulation of debris, the flow around buildings and how buildings behind buildings have to be designed. And suffice to say that, not that, there's a new chapter being worked on. There's a committee uh, that's working on uh, ASCE 7 Chapter 6 on tsunami loads and effects. Uh, if it's adopted, I think it's set to come out in the 2016 code. And uh, I'm really looking forward to seeing this. I think this committee is working very hard and we'll be uh, presenting some design guides that structural engineers can use going forward. Um, Laurie later on will talk about the relation of tsunami and buildings and emergency response kinds of facilities, um, which I think I can pass here. Anyway, key lessons, uh, just a, a few. You know, older buildings represent the biggest vulnerability. Uh, we've known that. Uh, URMs and concrete buildings are where our attention really needs to go. Uh, newer structures have really performed pretty well, but some of the observations on especially concrete wall buildings are suggesting that we can make some improvements in U.S. practice, and we should expect those things are going to be coming down the chute in the next few years. Um, unprotected non-structural systems, you have to expect problems with them. Um, nothing new there. Bridges are doing well uh, when designed by modern techniques or using the retrofitting uh, technologies that we now know. Tsunami design, there's some new ideas coming forward and some code requirements uh, if you're in a tsunami prone region. And that's the end of my story. Uh, any uh, questions? Jay, we have a little time for questions or discussion? Uh, one question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would be okay. Then we can, when the panel sits, we can bring up some. Yeah, more. okay, good. Yes. On the uh, concrete shear wall testing with respect to boundary elements, the yes. testing done with respect to return walls on the ends, does that change the performance in those? Uh, well, so if you've got a return wall, is it like a flange? Yeah, yeah. It, it affects the performance significantly. Um, and in, it's interesting, in New Zealand and in Chile, right after the earthquake, they had an emergency code change in which they essentially outlawed uh, compression controlled failure. So if you've got a, a flange here and the wall stem comes out here, if you flex it this way, you're always going to have a compression failure. And so there was a quick change in practice where they had big boundary elements showing up and returns on those walls to avoid that problem. Uh, and then engineers started complaining and architects complaining and, and owners complaining and that sort of went away and they've relaxed things a little bit. Um, but if you've got the return there to help protect that stem, that's good. 
if you've got the return, though, that's driving the load into the stem, it can be a problem. And there have been lab tests that have demonstrated that uh, to be a real problem. 